This episode of the Playlist Podcast is brought to you by City So Real, a masterwork, pulsing with life, utterly gripping. National Geographic's critically lauded documentary series City So Real appeared on more than a dozen 2020 best of lists, including President Obama's. The series from award-winning documentarian Steve James, director of Hoop Dreams, delivers a fascinating and complex portrait of Chicago, the quintessential American city, set against the backdrop of its history-making 2019 mayoral election and the tumultuous 2020 summer of COVID-19 and social upheaval following the death of George Floyd. The series is for your consideration for outstanding documentary or nonfiction series. For more information, visit natgotv.com slash FYC or stream all episodes now on Hulu. Hello and welcome to another marvelous episode of the Playlist Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike D'Angelo, and on this episode, my co-host Brian Farber and I got to sit down with the director, Kate Heron, who is the director of the show you might have heard of called Loki. So that hits Disney Plus today. Kate is a delightfully sweet person and a true fan of Loki. So it was really fun to just chat with her about the show and Marvel's general creative process and the impact that Loki, you know, is going to have on the universe whether we can expect a season two, you know, another character she'd want to work with within the Marvel Universe, and, and so much more. But before I send you on your merry little way to listen to us gush over Kate, I do have to tell you that the Playlist Podcast is part of the Playlist Podcast Network, which includes Be Real, Deep Focus, The Fourth Wall, and more, and can be heard on iTunes, Anchor FM, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and now Spotify, all any place you get your podcasts. So be sure to subscribe and drop us a comment or a rating, and as always, thank you so much. So much for listening. Now, without further delay, our chat with the wonderful Kate Heron. I want to welcome director Kate Heron to the Playlist Podcast to discuss her latest little project that you probably haven't heard of called Loki. It hits Disney Plus uh, this week. Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hello. Of course, of course. So, uh, you know, in, in kind of doing our research for this, I heard that you had a very intense, extensive pitch for this series. I think it was like 60 pages or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't expect you to go over that from front to back with us, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, how much of the spirit of that still remains? Is it changed at all or, or is it very much what you envisioned, you know, going in? Yeah, so I, I suppose it's like any project, right? Like you go in with a vision and an idea, but then obviously you bring on your brilliant team and you keep evolving, you know, the story, the design, everything, because it's collaboration. But I, I basically, I think when I went into it, I, I just felt like I wanted to give them a big download of everything in my brain. And I was very <laughs> aware that like, you know, the other directors I would be up against, I didn't know who they were, but I just had the assumption they're probably going to be more experienced than me because I hadn't done a big genre project like this before as a director. So I I basically covered everything, I think. Like I, I spoke about uh, design, uh, how the TVA would look and feel, um, what Loki meant to me as a character, music. Um, there's a few, I made like a playlist and there's actually a song I think this is okay. There's a song in episode two, um, Clara Rockmore's cover of The Swan, which you can hear in episode two. Um, that was in my original playlist. Um, so yeah, I just kind of went in and just was like, this is the tone and the feeling of the show and hopefully you guys like it. <laughs> but I just figured, you know, go big or go home because who knew, who knew they'd meet me again? But luckily they liked my pitch and here I am. So Hooray. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I wanted to to ask you i mean the look of of loki it's it's really like like retro futuristic like it, mm -hmm. it definitely brings to mind like those 70s sci-fi you know book covers really beautiful mm -hmm. covers like how did you settle on the look of the tva like specifically yeah so with the tva i would say like i wanted the whole show to be like kind of this love letter to sci-fi and so i stole from multiple sci-fi films um <laughs> Like, I mean, you know, Blade Runner, Metropolis, um, the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for like the fish out of water aspect. The font on the computers was sort of inspired by the ones in Alien. Um, what else? Uh, the time doors in the show from Dune. Um, there's lots of stuff that we were kind of referencing. I mean, but I think for me, like, so Kazra, the production designer, is a genius and something I, I felt from the off because basically I pitched and I had a lot of my pitches for the TVA in particular were trying to, 
I suppose, capture this place that's like, you know, in the comics, we see it has those amazing images where it's like desks going off into infinity, but the TVA is outside of space and outside of time. So it's not like on a planet, there's no sun. It's like this unknowable place. So it's kind of working out how do you capture the unknowable and make that for like a living, breathing office space. So it had like a kind of Vegas like quality to it. I, I think weirdly, because of that aspect, and also the mystery running through the show. Like I love film noir and I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to like give this kind of a detective look to it. Cause I think that could also lend itself to, you know, just the lighting cause there isn't day or night at the TVA. So yeah, so I think that was fun. But a lot of my pitch had a lot of brutalist architecture in it. Like um, <laughs> where I grew up in Southeast London, uh, I grew up near where they, where they filmed A Clockwork Orange and Children and Men was also filmed near where I live. And so I, I kind of, I think because the timekeepers are like these all knowing, like, you know, overseers of the timeline, I thought, oh, well, the brutalist architecture felt right for the TVA in that sense. And then because the TVA are very heroic, you know, they're, they're taking care of the timeline. I thought, well, Midwest is kind of cool, like bringing those two ideas together. And with the retro futuristic, I think honestly, some of it was obviously films like Brazil, but also my own experience working in offices as a temp because I remember working on computers that were like old and needed updating. And, <laughs> you know, a lot of these places I was temping at were like institutions as well. So I, they, they were not updating stuff. And I thought, oh, it'd be so funny to me if the people at like the top of the tree and in charge of our destiny, maybe they don't have the most futuristic, fut sorry, futuristic looking tech. Maybe it hasn't been updated because if it ain't broke, like, <laughs> so I kind of had that idea in my head and then Kazra came in and, we were just on the same page from the off. Like we had, I remember there were even images in his pitch that were in my pitch. So I was like, oh, we've got to work together on this. And yeah, and then obviously from those ideas together, you know, the TVA was born. I mean, something that was important to me and Kazra, but also my DP was that I love doing long takes. And I was really inspired by films like uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and Scott Pilgrim in the sense that, they have these amazing practical sets and you see characters, you know, like walk from one to the other. And I think for me, that was something we really wanted to do with the TVA. So, I mean, this is in the trailer, so I, I, I just really don't want to spoil stuff for people. But like, for example, like um, you see Tom and Owen step out of an elevator and they go down a hallway and into this room we call the time theater. But that was one massive set and we deliberately built it that way. So we could do stuff like that to, again, just make this sort of fantastical place feel like grounded in a real living, breathing environment. So, and breath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, speaking of, of Tom, I mean, everything I hear about, about Tom Hiddleston is that he's just the nicest, easiest, best guy to work with. But I, I guess I have to imagine that he's pretty protective of Loki, like as a character after like, you know, 10, over 10 years of, of playing him, were there ever points that you two disagreed or, you know, clashed on where you thought the character should go? Not really. I think the thing that was so nice, so when I first met Tom, basically I flew to New York to meet him before D23. And we had this really amazing chat just walking around the city together. And it was cool from a fan perspective because that's the last place we saw Loki was New York. So I was like, this is cool. Um, but honestly, it, I think the thing we were really united on was that the central, I, I think I remember him asking me about what I thought the show was about. And I was talking about, you know, what makes a villain and what makes a hero and that gray area in between is what generally interests me in characters anyway. Like, you know, can you move past any mistakes or will you always be defined by those or is there room for growth? And I think that was something that we both really connected on. And then beyond that, really, I just was talking to him about Loki and, what I loved about the character in the MCU and the comics. And he also had the same, you know, he also, we're both Loki nerds. So it, it was really just for us, I think, paying respect to what had come before because he's got one of the best arcs in the MCU, but also having a good reason to kind of go back in with the character and what kind of journey we we're going to take him on. Because obviously this is Loki from Avengers. He's in a very different emotional headspace to the Loki that we saw obviously change and grow and unfortunately die in Infinity War. So yes, yeah, so I think really, I think Tom called it synchronizing watches. And I think that's kind of what we did really in that first walk and, you know, around New York together. And yeah, he's been an amazing creative ally across the whole process. Yeah. And it, it, it is really fun to watch him kind of almost on his back foot 
you know, in these first couple episodes, not to really give anything away, but he's, he's kind of like, he's the fish out of water, which is kind of strange <laughs> for him. And it's, he plays it so hilariously and, and heartfelt. It's just, it's really fun. But, you know, getting over to the Marvel process of it all, everyone mm-hmm. we talk to that works with Kevin Feige or Marvel or whatever, it describes the process as like super collaborative. Mm-hmm. My, my basic challenge to you is, is to kind mm-hmm. of describe this process, how it works in, in, in that you know, with these series, there's a director, there's a showrunner, there's writers, there's Kevin, there's other people that are working on these shows. How how does it, how does everybody get input without choking each other, basically? Yeah, sure. Well, we didn't actually have a showrunner on Loki. Like, Oh, really? That's, so that was kind of you? More like, I would say, like, it's, it's a tricky one, right? Because, like, they ran these, like, movies. So I would say, like, you know, like, I filmed... All, obviously COVID stopped us halfway, but like, I think it was really collaborative from the go. Cause like I worked with Michael, like I would with a writer on a film. So we were both talking to each other and collaborating in that way. And he ran the writer's room. And then when I started, we did like a separate, like mini writer's room with Alyssa and Eric and Michael. And we were just talking about some more of the story, but really I would say like, you know, like Kevin Feige oversees everything at Marvel. So in a sense, I guess that, you know, he's the showrunner of Marvel, but I I think the best way I can always explain it to people is that they just ran it like a giant film. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. Which is why also my last day is tomorrow. (laughs) So, um, but yeah, I I mean, I I really enjoyed working on it. It was a really collaborative process. Um, I think Kevin Feige always kind of pushes you like even if you have a good idea for where you think the story could go or like you know a moment in the show he's always like it's great but let's like see if we can push it further let's see if we can break it and if we break it then we go back obviously because we know that you know this point works so I think it was just really fun working with him and obviously you know working with Marvel you're getting to work with like visual effects teams that are like top of their game and that was really amazing for me as a filmmaker and yeah but I'd really say it's really just about kind of going back to the synchronizing watches like you know me and michael we, we both connected like i i loved the script because i read the first episode when i pitched for it and i thought his script was fantastic and and you know i used to do improv and i think for me it was really just kind of yes anding all the ideas in there and keeping the integrity of like what the story was about but just always like oh okay cool this is great but maybe we could do this or we could do this and kind of just trying to be a good team player. I think that's really the thing with Marvel. I mean, you see like so many of the writers and filmmakers and just heads of department, they all go on to other stuff with Marvel. So I think it's, yeah, just sort of being a good collaborator, uh, sorry, collaborator, really. No, that's <laughs> fine. Um, so with WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier having come out and you guys were kind of developing these things uh, at the same time almost, you know, was there ever a point where you're like checking in with them to, to make sure things are all lining up correctly? Or maybe you're just talking as, as directors and you're like, okay, that's what they're doing. We really need to like either up our game here or we're on the right track because I think we really have a strong identity here. Was there ever like the, a, a no shit moment or was it like, I've got this? No. So I would say honestly, like, so the secret source in our show, there's a a creative producer called Kevin Wright and he was working with Stephen Broussard, the other executive. And obviously like they are both like, you know, everyone at Marvel is always talking and checking in and really Kevin Wright would let me know if anything was, you know, going towards something or the other. But I think the main thing that I really liked about working with them all was that it was always like, you know, story first. And if it's good for story, or good for a moment in the show and everyone's excited about it, then they would kind of work it out as an, I assume, speak to the other filmmakers or, you know, the ripple effect that some of these decisions would have. So no, I, I think honestly, it was more, I would say Kevin Wright um, and Kevin Feige just kind of letting us know if there was anything, but I really didn't, to be honest, feel like I was being kept in check at all. If anything, I was always being pushed to go further, go weirder, or just try and make the best story we could. So I think that's part of the secret sauce at Marvel is, is just like, they're always trying to say weirder, weirder. And that's <laughs> magical. That's what's magical about Loki. It's, it's so weird, but in a great way. Yeah. And Kevin, Kevin Feige himself has said the show has more impact on the, on the MCU than any of the previous shows. And the fact that you're dealing with these multi-universal 
timelines, you know, that, that might have something to do with it. I mean, with all this said, can we expect any big names to pop up over the course of these later episodes? <laughs> I would say it's very Just say cheap. It. <laughs> <laughs> No, I would say honestly, like, because, you know, I think the cool thing without spoiling things for anyone, I would say that, you know, the thing I thought was cool, because I remember when I first read the first script, so there's this moment where Loki obviously sees the Infinity Stones in this drawer and they're like, oh, yeah, they're paperweights here. I remember reading that and being like, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> invested so much of my time into the films before. And but I think that's kind of the joy of our show, right, is that the TVA, this, like, new corner of the MCU we kind of built upon some ideas of time travel, but it's almost like, actually, no, you know, it's almost like when we used to think the earth was a different, you know, when we thought, was, we used to think the earth was flat and actually now it's like, oh no, actually now we see the earth this way. And I think there's like an interesting thing with that in the sense that, you know, we thought of time travel this way, but actually when you go to the TVA, learning about it through Loki's eyes, you're like, oh, actually the rules for this are very different. So I would mainly say like in terms of that, like, yeah, it's going to have an effect obviously because we've introduced this whole idea of time into the TVA and also just what the TVA do, the timekeepers and that, you know, free will and destiny. Like <laughs> as we see with Loki, like, you know, he wasn't supposed to steal the Tesseract and what has that done to reality? So yeah, I would say like in that sense, I can't speak for other projects within the MCU, but yeah, it will just in the nature of us defining these new rules for the MCU that, yeah, it will have effects upon it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and yeah, kind of along those similar lines, there was a, a report that dropped today that Loki is a standalone, just one season, which seems to kind of contradict other reports that there's a second season. Your thoughts on that? Are you kind of able to clarify that a little bit at all? Yeah, I mean, for me, I feel like it's the one season and like, you know, I finish next week. So I'm very much just focused on this. Um, yeah, I mean, anything else I think would probably be something that Marvel will. I mean, you never know what Kevin Feige is planning. But no, as far as I'm aware, this is Loki's story and this is what I'm on for. And <laughs> yeah, and we wanted to tell like just a good story really across these six episodes for him. So sure. Um, any other Marvel properties that you're that you're going to be working on or anything that you're looking to work on or any characters that you'd love to work with? Oh, there are so many, you know. I would say, I'm trying to think. I'm a massive Spider-Man fan. That would always be a dream of mine. I, and I think Tom Holland is fantastic. I've really been enjoying his version of the character. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, who knows? I mean, I'm really, you know, Kevin Feige is almost like my timekeeper so <laughs> like huh. he wants to control my destiny and throw something else my way that would be lovely but yeah but I want to see like for me like I love Loki he's my favorite character so that's why I made that you know intense document because I was like you've got to hire me for it so yeah so I um it was really just like a dream come true honestly just getting to tell his story so anything beyond that would just be you know cherry on top so yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it speaks a lot to their their process in general, like we were talking about before, that they have all these people that they're working with and everybody that we talk to says something very similar, like if if mm -hmm. Kevin called, I would do this again in a second. So that I think that really makes sense, you know, that why they're being, you know, why they're Marvel. It, they're yeah. really nurturing creatives over there, which is a, a huge thing. But as far as Loki as a character and your love for Loki, I am curious to know um because this is something we were kind of debating before the interview it, like i don't expect you to spoil anything or say that this happens in the show or anything like that but is there was this debate is loki worthy of love is he uh, someone who should have a love interest or a love story and you know some of us are just like yeah absolutely the the guy should you know eventually find someone that he can open up with and uh, other people are like the only people the only person he's going to love is himself which mm -hmm. again you could take in different ways uh in, in this show so um i'm curious where you land on that where, where do you see loki as a character and in, in the love of it all oh i think he's definitely a character worthy of love i mean that bit in Ragnarok with him and Thor in the elevator and it, it's awful, right? You almost see his heartbreak when his brother's like, I think he'd be really good for you here. And it's just like, oh, he thinks so little of me. But I think that's why, like, 
I'm trying to think his relationship with his brother, I think is such a good example of that, right? Like there's so much pain there and obviously mistakes that were made, but I was so happy when there was that reconcile and, you know, I'm here and I think everyone was cheering for him when that happened. So no, I think he definitely is. I mean, I, I think that's why I love the character really is that, and why that arc across the last 10 years was so satisfying because, you know, he dies trying to protect his brother. And like, is that not the greatest act of love <laughs> there is? So mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely think he's worthy of it. I, the only thing I would say for our show is that, you know, he's he's not that same Loki from Infinity War, obviously he hasn't had that journey, but I think with that, there's a lot to be dug into because without getting too nerdy about it, like nature and nurture, right? Like we kind of, he isn't arrested and goes to Asgard, he goes to the TVA <laughs> and it's a, you know, he's, chaotic and we put him into a place of order so i think for me it'll be really interesting seeing you know loki's in a very broken place when he's arrested by the tva and i think it'll be interesting to see how he changes and grows across the show and is it a similar path or not i don't want to spoil anything but yeah but i i would say yeah i feel like no matter where our loki goes or how he's affected by what we do to him in the show that i definitely think that he's worthy of love for sure awesome uh, and I was on the same side there. But uh, <laughs> as far as, you know, we're all big fans of like uh, sex education and, and Loki obviously is a huge one for us. Um, I guess I'm just wondering what else you have coming up in the pipe. Is there anything you can talk about that maybe things might be coming up? Yeah, so I'm writing a comic book for Skybound. Um, and that's going to be out, I think, around Halloween. It's like a awesome. horror comedy comic. Um, that's probably all I'm allowed to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that's on the horizon. And they've been very patiently waiting for me to send them a new draft while I've been working on this show. So I'm very gracious with them. Um, and I'm also working on a TV show with the same writer I'm doing the comic with, Bryony Redman. Um, and it's sort of like a fun, weird sci-fi show. Surprise, surprise. Um, yeah. And that's probably all I can say about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. But no, right. there are lots, lots in the works and cooking along. But honestly, my main project is going to be sleep and relaxation when I'm done on this because I haven't Good. stopped for two years. So I'm just going to kind of chill out and play some games, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine there's a lot to catch up with at this point. You know, Marvel is probably an all attention grabbing thing. Definitely. Um, I need to finish God of War and <laughs> I've got a lot of things that I need to just, yeah see people i mean like so many of us right like i haven't seen my family in nearly two years now so yeah so just you know normal things so yeah. so yeah so you've got you know a netflix show you've got a disney plus show slash marvel fucking marvel <laughs> show you've got a comic book you know you've got other things that you've you've done what what's what's the next dream do you have anything or are you like I've che i'm checking things off too quickly here or <laughs> what's what's the thing the dream I think honestly, just the show that I'm creating with my writing partner, Bryony, like that's been a passion project of ours for like over a decade now. And I just, I think for me, like bringing that to life, like that would be so exciting because in terms of the TV directing I've done, it's always taking on, you know, like great characters and great stories, but I'd love to just bring one to life that's from my head, I guess, in that sense that, you know, it's not based on anything beforehand, just as a new challenge. Like I've, I've loved everything I've worked on and I've learned so much on them as well so yeah but i suppose that would be the next challenge for me <laughs> nice one thing at a time i totally get it yeah um and, and we don't want to keep you too long but uh i do want to thank you so much for taking the time to to speak with us today it's been a delight catching up with you and talking about loki and all the things you got coming up we've seen the first two episodes we can say that we can't say anything else but i can say that i've absolutely loved every minute of them yeah. so uh, i can't wait to watch what else is coming and uh, again thank you so much for talking to us no, thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you.